So let's see. Carrying on from what Michael talked about, um, what I want to do is present an alternative technique which also gives us views of proteins at an atomic level. And that's a completely different method using nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, but I want to set this up sort of in a different way, is sort of start with the problem we're interested in and then explain how we use uh, NMR. So just as a very, very um, kind of superficial introduction, this is a, sort of a schematic picture of a cell. It doesn't actually look like this, but that's okay. I think we appreciate that a cell has an outside, has an inside, which is a nucleus, and inside the nucleus is DNA. And there's sort of a general problem in biology, is how does a cell actually respond to something from the outside and do something on the inside. And it's often called signal transduction. So some form of signal on the outside, many things can occur, will go through a, a cascade of events. And those events usually are proteins or other molecules interacting with each other, sometimes chemically modifying each other. And eventually this goes into the nucleus where proteins will interact with the DNA, which encodes as our genetic material, and then turn genes on or off. And then genes, of course, encode other proteins to give a certain response. Now, the proteins that sort of control this at the level of the DNA are often called transcription factors because they're transcribing the DNA into a message. And these proteins bind to DNA. And right now, we're just drawing them as sort of blobs. So if you don't know what the structure is, just draw a blob. This is what we'll call a transcription factor, and this is kind of a representation of DNA. So in response to some signal from the outside, there'll be changes in that DNA binding transcription factor, which may cause it to bind DNA, but then it also causes it to bind other molecules, which might change the structure of the DNA, other things that are needed to bring in other molecules to build this whole machine with an enzyme called RNA polymerase, which then reads the DNA and makes RNA, which eventually becomes proteins. So that's sort of just a very general overview of this. And in my group, we work on one specific type of transcription factor called ETS or ETS. Most things in biology have a TLA. A TLA is a three-letter abbreviation. The three-letter abbreviation usually is some bizarre way somebody discovered a few things. ETS actually stands for, it's an oncovirus. Um, it also stands for externally transmitted smoke, if you were to look at it. Anyways, there's 28 kinds of tra ETS transcription factors in every one of you, you have. And these are controlling the gene expression. And so we're interested in how they work. And because they are the, the proteins that control gene expression, if they don't work right, we end up with what? <laughs> that would occur, but just in a very general statement. There's the, the big diseases out there, heart disease, right, and microbial infections, and Cancers. cancer. So anytime your transcription of your genes regulation is off, it'll be sort of related to type of cancer. And there's many ways that transcription factors may cause that. For example, some of these ETS proteins, actually in our DNA, a virus might come along and insert itself in the DNA and start changing things. And what can often occur is they make more ETS protein. If there's more ETS, then everything ETS controls is now going to be out of sync. And that's actually one form of cancer that's um, occurred. So a virus makes too much ETS, it comes along and it turns on ETS-related genes. Another one we might loosely call Franken-ETS. Sometimes our chromosomes, which include our DNA, actually can break and rearrange. And if they are rearranged, they can sometimes, if they are rearranged just the right way, take one part of a protein that normally does something, bind DNA, and another part of a protein that normally some, does something different, and glue them together. And now you've got a protein that kind of has two identities, neither of which is correct. And that'll have altered gene expression too and can be linked to cancer. There's another one too, is that there's a whole pathway going from the outside of a cell to the inside of a cell to control gene expression. And the transcription factors are at the end of this. But often other parts of the machinery upstream tend to be wrong. And if they're wrong, then everything downstream is wrong, and you'll end up getting a response, which is not very good. OK, so the goal then is for us as structural biologists is to understand sort of this jigsaw puzzle of how these molecules interact with each other. And the interaction depends on their shapes. And that really defines the whole field of structural biology, is understanding the shapes of molecules and how they fit together. So Michael explained in a very nice way how one way we can get the shapes of molecules is by a technique called X-ray crystallography. We're almost taking a picture of the molecule with some limitations that he explained.
There's another way, which is using NMR spectroscopy. Oh, I, I forgot to actually say one thing. One of the reasons in terms of S proteins we might be interested, probably one is just a diagnostic level to understand if there's a cancer, there's mutations, what may have just gone wrong. And the other is the holy grail, which we all write in grant reports, but it's very much a holy grail, is maybe we could actually manipulate those transcription factors to control things. Anyways, so the goal of the research, part of the research in our lab then, is to understand how these proteins are regulated, and we use the awesome power of NMR spectroscopy, which is very cool. Okay, how many of you have actually had an MRI taken of some part of you? They're great, aren't they? You crawl inside this big magnet, you don't feel anything, you hear some noises, but it's completely non-invasive. And if you go inside the magnet, eventually you can take really nice pictures, three-dimensional pictures of parts of your body. I've often wondered why I have a 10-second memory span, and that's the answer. <laughs> okay. I actually do have a 10-second memory span. Okay, but so MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, why is the N not there? Nobody likes the word nuclear, do they? The nuclear is good. Okay, so it should be really NMRI imaging, but we don't want that. And it was predating that, and all these are Nobel Prizes associated with it, and there's many Nobel Prizes with X-ray crystallography too. Um, it's a technique called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And what it involves is a very large magnet, which then we can look at parts of molecules. This is a former postdoctoral fellow in the group working. This is a sample. I'll show you a little bit more. This is one of the magnets we have, and it's in the chemistry building. We call it a 600 megahertz NMR spectrometer. I'll explain what that number means in one second. Bigger is better in NMR. This is, for example, is a bigger magnet called a 900 megahertz NMR spectrometer, and bigger also costs a lot more. Although magnet technology has improved an awful lot, and actually we have almost as big of a magnet in terms of magnetic strength sitting in the basement of this building, but they're a lot, more small, or a lot smaller these days because of technology. So in the basement of this magnet, we have an 850 megahertz NMR spectrometer, which is, this is the magnet, and there are some electronic consoles, and it's about that high, you know, that big. So it's not too outrageous. Okay, and don't worry, it's near, but you're not feeling any of the magnetic field. It's all inside of this thing. Okay, so there's a couple parts to an NMR spectrometer that are important. One is a magnet, and the other is electronics. And this is worth, I think, about $2 million. So if you were to take a chainsaw to this, which would be really a bad idea, but if you were to do that and ask what was inside, you'd see the following. So this is an old picture of a magnet. And essentially what it has is a wire coil inside, which creates a magnetic field. I hope most of you appreciate if you put current through an electric a coil, it'll have a magnetic field. And it's called superconducting, which means it has no resistance. So when you charge the magnet, we put in about 100 amps of current, it just spins forever as long as it stays superconducting. And because the current is moving, it creates a very strong magnetic field inside of it. Now to get the superconducting, one needs special wires, and they also have to be cooled to liquid helium temperature, which is four degrees above absolute zero, or minus 270 degrees Celsius. So it's sitting in this liquid helium, keeps it very cold, so it's superconducting. Of course, the liquid helium is so cold that it can evaporate readily. So we have to have this thing inside a very nice vacuum. And then on the outside of the vacuum, we actually have liquid nitrogen, which is merely 77 degrees above absolute zero, just to keep things a little colder. But this is all totally self-contained. That is an error thanks to Mac. Um, OK, this is completely self-contained. And there's actually a hole from the bottom to the top of this. It's like a donut, actually. You can look down through it. And through that hole is where you put your sample. It would be just like your body in an MRI imager. You're inside this thing, but you don't feel that liquid helium, but it's close to you. And that's where we put a sample. Now the sample is in a tube, and it's about a half a millimeter liter of liquid, and the tube's a half a centimeter wide. And that's our sample tube, and we put it in what we call a probe, and that has some electronic detection coils in it. And this whole thing sits in the magnet, but it's at room temperature. And that's what the example we detect then. OK, now the way NMR sort of works, we can think of the following. We're looking not at electrons, which is what electron X-ray crystallography does. Atoms have a nucleus, protons, neutrons, and they have electrons around them. 
Michael looks at electrons, I look at protons. So the inside, the nucleus of a molecule, of an atom, is actually like a little magnet. So we can think of it as having a north-south pole. And if we put this inside a superconducting magnet, very, very strong, then these will actually, we say, align in the magnetic field. The Earth has a magnetic field. We use it any time with a compass, but that's not strong enough to actually detect this. This is about 10,000 times, yeah, 10,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, which is why we need a magnet in the first place. So this can be aligned, and it turns out that if we apply energy at just the right frequency, we can cause those spins to flip, or what we call as resonate. And that energy is actually radio frequency energy. So when you're in your car and you want to listen to CBC, what do you turn the FM radio to? The f What's the units? Megahertz. Kilohertz is, is um, AM radio. So it's, it, we're being bombarded. You stick a cell phone to your head. You're, that's the kind of energy you're putting into your brain. I don't know if it does you good or not, but it's pretty low energy that's not doing very much. And the 600 then megahertz, we talk about the speedometer, is not the freak, how strong the magnet is. It's the energy we have to put in to make the nucleus just flip. So an 850 megahertz magnet, it's a stronger magnet. It takes more energy to cause them to flip. So if we do that, we record a spectrum. And I want to just show you what an NMR, NMR spectrum might look like. How many of you remember organic chem where you probably had to take this? A few. OK. This is a simple amino acid. It's alanine. And we're just going to look at protons. So NMR, we actually detect the hydrogen nucleus, the proton. And it's in D2O. We're not going to, we don't see deuterium. So that just makes it simpler. Now, from what I just told you about this little description of a bar magnet, well, we should just get one signal because we're looking at protons. And that's where the physicist took NMR. Then the chemist came along and said, oh, but if we look carefully, we don't see one signal. We see two signals from this molecule. And they're separated by a part per million, a very small amount, but very easy to measure. And it turns out that separation is what we call chemical shift. And the point is that that nucleus has electrons around it. And the different types of atoms have different amounts of electrons. And those electrons actually shield the nucleus from the magnetic field. So it takes either more or less energy to cause the spin to flip, depending on the chemical structure. So for example, this is alanine. And also, you notice that this peak is three times bigger than that peak. So in fact, this signal is from these methyl CH3 protons. And this one is from the alpha proton. This is why chemists love NMR because it tells you something about molecules. Biologists, we know what the amino acids are. Chemists often will synthesize any molecule, and they have to figure out what it is. And there's two ways they do it. One, they determine how heavy it is. They measure the mass. The other is they use NMR to figure out what's in it. OK. Biologists use it in a slightly different way. These are NMR spectra of biological molecules. So this is a protein. This is DNA, and this is a polysaccharide. They all have protons, and we can study them. And they all have very different spectra and complicated spectra, which I'll come back to in a second. OK. It turns out there's something else really remarkable about NMR. Is not only do the frequencies that these flip at depend upon what they are, protons that are near each other actually talk to each other. Not through Facebook, but through bonds. And if you look very carefully, you can see this signal is actually two signals, and this signal is actually four signals. And they're split by just a small amount, but again, it's easy to measure. And the reason is, if we look at this signal from the methyl, what it's seeing is that the proton that's this, this proton here, it turns out that the bar magnets are almost equally with and against the magnetic field. It's a very small difference because it's a very weak energy aligning them, and thermal energy almost randomizes it. So half the molecules in this tube have this spin aligned with the magnetic field, and half have it against. And whether this is with or against the magnetic field will make this energy slightly different. Similarly, this proton here sees these three protons. There's one way all three of those protons can be aligned. There's one way they can all be anti-aligned. There's three ways that one could be up and two down. And there's three ways one could be down and two up. Up and down means aligned or not. So we actually get 
this one to three to three to one pattern because we can see all the different spins in there. The really important thing from this though is these nuclei talk to each other so we can connect them and we can learn something about chemical structure. So this is an NMR spectrum of a protein and we notice the difference between it's made of alanine and 19 other amino acids. The difference between this and the other is there's a lot more signals and it's very complicated. So we have to figure out how do we sort this out to learn something. The other important thing is that the chemical shift, the exact frequency they resonate depends on their structure. So if we can figure out where they come, if we can actually identify them, we can learn about their structure and actually end up calculating the structure of a protein. But there's so many peaks in here and a bigger protein might have a thousand signals. So we've got to sort this out. So we have to have a new way to do it. And this is actually one of the most remarkable things about NMR spectroscopy. Let's just think of a simple case where we have three protons and they have signals A, B, and C. This is actually simple because they're separated. This is a one-dimensional spectrum. It's one-dimensional, not like structure, but one dimension because we have one frequency and there's an intensity. The remarkable thing about NMR is we can use that thing that nuclei talk to each other to generate what's called a two-dimensional NMR spectrum. And in a two-dimensional NMR spectrum, we actually get the signals of two nuclei that are interacting. So this is the proton here, and it's interacting with a nitrogen that it's bonded to. This one and this. So now we take those three crowded signals in one dimension and spread them out in two dimensions. This is phenomenal, the fact you can do this. This is sort of also relates to MRI a little bit. Okay, well, why bother stopping with two dimensions? Let's go to three dimensions. And again, I don't want three dimensions to mean structure. I mean three frequencies. So we could say, have recorded an NMR spectrum where we get a proton that's connected to a nitrogen that's connected to a carbon. And now we spread this information out even further. And each of these dots has three different frequencies. And it turns out that along an amino acid chain, this proton talks that nitrogen to this carbon. We can do a different experiment where this proton talks that nitrogen to the same carbon. And since we have a common point, we can identify who is next to who. And by carrying out a whole bunch of these experiments, we can put names on all the signals. So we can do what we call assigning a spectrum. And this is actually an NMR spectrum of the ETS protein. And each of these dots is actually a proton that's connected to a nitrogen. And every amino acid has one proton connected to one nitrogen, except prolines. So each of these corresponds to one amino acid that's making up this protein. And we can see it's nicely spread out, and there's names, if you could read them, because we know who they are. And since we know who they are, we can ask questions about their structures. So we're getting there, but we still have to figure out how do we get a structure. Well, it turns out there's another amazing NMR experiment, is that protons can talk to each other not only through bonds, but through space. So if one proton is near another, they interact. And this is called a nuclear overhauser effect. And it allows us to measure distances. So what can we do with distances? Well, how far is it between Vancouver and Edmonton? Invent a number, it doesn't matter. Just say something. Yeah, 800 kilometers. Okay, how about Vancouver to Whitehorse? Let's say 2,000. Actually, Yellowknife, I'm sorry. How about Yellowknife to Toronto? 5,000. How about Edmonton to Regina? Maybe 300 or 1,000, and so forth. If I told you all the distances between the cities in Canada, could you draw me a map? Yeah. Or it's mirror image, of course. I know some of you were thinking about that. OK. So yeah, we could just build a map by giving you enough distances. So in NMR, the way this works, then is we measure all the distances between the protons in a molecule. And this is a diagram of a molecule. Again, these are rep our representations. Molecules don't look like this, right? They're just pretty pictures. But each of these lines here, the faint little lines, is a distance that we can measure. And so by connecting things, we can build the three-dimensional structure of the molecule. So it's a very different way than what Michael talked about with x-rays, where we're taking a picture with the x-rays. Here, we're doing it more indirect. We're measuring distances. When this first came out, though, this was actually really wonderful because crystallography was more advanced than NMR. But you, know, you could say, well, 
what if crystallographers are wrong? Right? They're, doing, they're making crystals and they're sticking them in x-rays. And this was a completely independent way to show that we end up with the same structure. So two different ways tells us that we're actually thinking on the same wavelength, so to speak. Okay, so if we were to apply this to this protein ATS, we could degenerate a structure. And I just want to show this as kind of a cartoon. This is a sort of a one representation of the molecule. That was its surface, because molecules are kind of solid. You can't poke your finger through them. This is just coloring it by its charge. Blue is positive, red is negative. And then we can sort of strip the surface away and start looking at the atoms. Mike did exactly this. And I've colored the backbone of the atom in kind of orange. We can spin it around, we see what it's made of, and then we end up making these really wonderful pictures. And the graphics behind molecular structural biology is wonderful too, but they, it's also very deceptive because you think of a molecule as this colored thing with ribbons and lines and you could poke through it and see the inside, but it's not. It's actually packed as dense as a solid. You can't go through this thing very easily, but we just sort of strip this away. Okay, so that's basically how we determine structures of molecules by NMR. So we can learn a few things about the ATS proteins. For example, we can also look at the protein bound to DNA. This is the ATS protein here, and this is a piece of DNA. And it's binding in what's called the major groove of the DNA. And we're just kind of spinning around various views. So this is telling us how that protein actually recognizes parts of our genes. And it's kind of nice pictures. And we could look at this a little more, for example. One of the real themes in structural biology, just as when you solve a jigsaw puzzle, right? You look for the, the piece, pieces that are complementary, the, you know, this fits into that and so forth, right? The shapes are complementary to each other. And that's how molecular biology or well, chemistry, biology, chemistry works, is complementarity. So for example, DNA turns out it's negatively charged because it has a phosphate backbone. And proteins that bind DNA are positively charged. That was that structure I showed going around when I was coloring it red and blue. It actually has a lot of positive charge. And opposites attract, so DNA can bind to proteins. But then we could also zoom in. This is just another representation drawing into cylinders. But we can also look in and we could sort of see this is a helix here of the protein and it's in the major groove of the double-stranded DNA. And we see again, these are what we call the side chains of the amino acids and these are the bases that make up DNA. And there's this beautiful structural complementarity to them. They fit each other. And these little dotted yellow lines are what we call hydrogen bonds. And that's a very special interaction between an oxygen and a nitrogen or an oxygen and oxygen with a hydrogen in the middle. That's what makes water so wonderful. Water is sort of built by this and water has these unusual properties. It floats when it's a solid and all of these. It's because of hydrogen bonds and we exist because of hydrogen bonds. And they're very precise interactions. And then there's a few others. And Michael showed exactly the same thing. So we zoom inside the molecule and we ask what builds it. Okay. But now we want to get to learn something about regulation. This is just another schematic, and sorry, I, these are slides from different places, so I keep changing the colors, but this is this DNA binding part of the ETS protein, and this is DNA. We determine that structure. But when we actually determine the structure of the molecule, we found it had not only a part that binds DNA, it's got another part sort of interfaced with it. And it turns out it's called the inhibitory module, and in this case, what the job of this part is, is to stop this from binding DNA. So it auto-inhibits itself. It prevents itself from binding to DNA. And it's actually built sort of like layers on an onion then, if you want. We have an inside part that binds to DNA, and there's another part stuck on it which controls it. And this is a general theme in biology. Not everything is auto-inhibited, but we can build functions into molecules by putting pieces together. Okay, so the question then is, how does this work? Especially since the DNA is over here, and the part that controls it is actually on the other side of the molecule. And this is what we call actually allosteric effects, things that sort of work at a distance by talking through the molecule. But how do you actually do that? Well, it turns out one thing that both Michael and I have done, in, well, we've done, and everyone in structural biology does it, is if you look at this, it looks like it's static. And it, Michael used the word snapshots, like we took a picture of it. But molecules, it's really important to emphasize, are not static. They move. That was bring it timing. <laughs> so molecules are constantly moving, wiggling and jiggling. The parts are always going on. And we're just taking pictures of, the snap of them. So we have to remember, when you see a picture, that's not correct. It's like you did a freeze frame and you stopped something. 
but then it can move further. And he showed you those two endpoints of something binding. In this case, it's emphasizing that molecules are moving. I can't go into it now, because between now and the food out there, but NMR is actually, its real strength is not the structure, but it's characterizing the motions of molecules. This is actually very, what we call small scale fast motions. If you wonder how fast this is, this is occurring on about a nanosecond or faster time scale. Okay? 10 to the minus 9th seconds. So in your body, all the proteins are moving around, and in a second, they've moved well over a billion times little steps, actually much more. That may seem a lot to you, but it turns out molecules also tumble in solution, and a molecule tumbles about this much in about nine, 5 nanoseconds. So it's the time scale that molecules are actually moving. You can have larger motions of molecules too, where whole parts of molecules bind things and change. This is just an enzyme, it's a nice movie I grabbed, just showing how chunks of a molecule can actually move. Again, I just want to emphasize the fact that mo molecules are mobile, and we saw that a lot in Michael's talk too. Okay, so when we actually study the ETS proteins, we find that when the protein binds to DNA, this part of the protein that actually is inhibiting DNA binding actually falls apart. And so what it is, is there's an energetic penalty. We have something that wants to make a nice helix, and we're breaking it. It costs us energy. And we get that back by forming a, co a complex with DNA, which gains energy. So we're balancing something. We're having to pay a little price to get something. And it's paying that price that inhibits its own DNA binding. So just kind of trying to summarize this, we have this is a, yet another view of the molecule that can bind DNA. And we have a part that's ready to unfold. And it's folded at the moment. And when it binds to DNA, it's unfolded. And that has an energetic price to it. So then we can, that's one way. And there are many, many ways to regulate transcription factors. This is one. A certain cellular signal can come along. And for example, that signal could make this helix unfold more. And if it does, then what happens? You bind DNA better. Alternatively, there's changes that occur that can prevent that helix from unfolding, and then you'd make DNA binding worse. So it's a way to turn the protein on and off in response to a signal. If you're wondering what the signal is, it's either another protein or a chemical modification. OK. So I'd like to just to end then with saying that what Michael and I have hopefully shown is that there are different methods where structural biologists can look at biological molecules at the level of atoms. NMR spectroscopy, we use a very large magnet, and we actually measure the energy it takes for the little nuclei to flip back and forth. And the features of that energy tell us about their environment. And we can measure distances. And from all that information, we can actually deduce the structure of a molecule by just measuring distances between parts of it. In contrast, X-ray crystallography, which by the way gives a much higher resolution or more accurate picture of a structure, we involve making crystals and shining X-rays through, which tells us where the electrons are. And by knowing that then, we can also build the shapes of the molecules. And it's very important to emphasize that the two are complementary techniques. In fact, crystallographers often use NMR information for dynamics. NMR spectroscopers often use crystal structures to start off their solving problems and understanding things. So very much a complementary methods of doing that. And finally, I don't do any work because I have a 10 second memory span because you know why, but this is just some of the people in the group who've done some of the work here. A few are in the audience and another half of the lab works on quite different uh, molecules. And I think with that, we will end. So thank you for coming.